we love you today, and we just thank you for this service. Thank you for this time to be together. We pray a blessing upon all of us. Lord, we love you, and uh, thank you that you're Lord of all. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. online. It's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to experience the love of God in the special worship service today. So let's worship God. Our first hymn this morning is Majesty, Worship His Majesty, page 176. <laughs> Father, we're thankful for this. 
So, Father, as we seek to be disciples of Jesus, as we seek to grow as disciples of Jesus, help us in that endeavor. Help us to love you, love our neighbor. Help us, Father, to, to seek first the kingdom of God. Through your Holy Spirit, enable us to see the good in ourselves and others that you have placed there. And help us, Father, to, to discipline ourselves, to resist the evil of this, of this world. Father, we thank you for Jesus who died on the cross, rose again the third day. Thank you for the victory he has given us. Thank you for the sacrifice of love that he gave on our part. Father, we ask that we would live in his example and we would follow in his footsteps. Father, we thank you for the many blessings. Thank you for spring mm -hmm. weather. Thank you for family and friends. Thank you for, for your provision that is just right and always on time. Maybe not in the way we would see timing, but in your timing. It's always right. Father, continue to watch over the military especially those of our family and friends that are a part of that. We lift up Sam and Delia to you and Robbie and others, Father, that are upon our hearts and our minds, friends and family, loved ones that we pray for. We lift them to you. Maybe they're going through a difficult time. Maybe they're seeking help. Maybe, Father, they're struggling. Father, be close beside them. Father, you know those names that came to our hearts and our minds. And they're real to you. They are people you love and whom we love when we pray for them. Father, continue to bless this worship service and may it honor Jesus. Guide us in all that we do. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray and worship. And we pray that prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is on page 370, Victory in Jesus. <clears throat>
For those who view us online, uh, remember you can send your tithes and offerings to the address found on our Facebook page and directly to our treasurer. We have opportunities to give at every service. Let's celebrate God's many blessings with the doxology. Praise God.
riches, as I call them, to church. I also remember one very cold uh, Bible study night in which the women wore long dresses and underneath their dresses they were talking that they had pants on. And I remember as a kid thinking, wait a minute, God knows that they have riches on in church. Now don't misunderstand me. I don't think there's anything wrong with women wearing pants or wearing them to church. I want you to come to church and worship the Lord. But I remember that argument, that distinction, if you will, in the little church of which I was a part. And they had scriptures that they were quoting. I also remember in my own family growing up, I liked to, to, to go hunting when I was growing up. I'd step out into the woods and back of the, the home where I was raised, and you could walk for miles and stay in the woods. And I would go out there, and, and I liked to squirrel hunt. And uh, my grandmother, she didn't believe you should hunt or fish on Sunday. That was the day, that was the Lord's day you were supposed to worship. Of course, my dad and my uncle, who was my dad's brother, when they grew up and got older, they went hunting and fishing on Sunday. But I was still sort of under the house rule, so to speak. And I remember, I was, maybe I was just paying attention in church. It's good to pay attention in church. But the Sabbath, in the Old Testament, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? That's actually Saturday. The Jewish people worship on Saturday. From sundown Friday to, to sunrise. And so, all of a sudden, I had a newfound weapon in the argument. I said, wait a minute, the Sabbath is actually Saturday, so it would be okay to go hunting and fishing on Sunday. <laughs> well, I may have won the skirmish, but I lost the battle. <laughs> but even today, don't get me wrong, I think we should worship the Lord. And we should worship the Lord with all of our heart. And, and we, I believe, very devoutly in coming to church and worshiping with others. And I'm so glad we're worshiping God this morning. But I also know that in the afternoon, if somebody wanted to go hunting and fishing, then I don't think that would be necessarily a bad thing. Maybe to miss church to do it, unless it was your vacation, that might not be such a good thing. Because as I said before, I want you to come to church. I want you to worship the Lord. I want you to engage. But I say that all that to say this, that I know all of us have experienced uh, arguments, disagreements, possibly in our church, where we work, school, maybe even in our own families. And so when the scripture tells a story of how an early church came up with trying to to find a process, a way of taking the, the, the real problems and, and, and figuring out a way to honor God and work through them. I think it's important that we look at that. For you see, this, this problem, this challenge, if you will, was a serious one. And serious problems should be given serious consideration. You see, from the very first verse, it says people came amongst the Christians. And remember, the early church was very Jewish. The, the disciples, even Jesus himself was Jewish. They, they saw that heritage of the Old Testament, of, of the dietary laws and the way it is to be Jewish and keeping the Torah. And that, that was important to their identity. And Jesus comes along and, and he's a continuation of that. He's Lord, he's Savior, but he was Jewish, and it's, it's a continuation of that. And so that was a very strong influence in the early church. And so there were those people who were Christian who said, yes, you've got to undergo circumcision. You've got to keep the dietary laws. You've got to live according to the customs of Moses. And here's where it gets serious, because if you don't, you can't be saved. Whoa. You see, being saved, that 
gets at the heart of what being a Christian in the church is about. And, and I mean so much more than just a ticket to heaven. It's being saved is when Jesus can come into your heart, into your life, and forgive you and transform you. Being saved, in a sense, is being made right with God. Being saved is, is somehow being a part of the church and all that it means to live for Christ and be the very best Christ follower that you can be. And yes, there's that sense of, of the afterlife and eternity and being in heaven. But being saved carries with it so much about who it is to be a Christian that you are made right with God and you're trying to follow after God in the best way that you can in the way of righteousness. So when they said, if you don't do this, you can't be saved. It was a heavy question. It was like, if you don't do this, it will be catastrophic. So a serious question deserves serious consideration. This is heavy. And we've all kind of felt that in those arguments, maybe at work, at school, at work, in our own families, felt the way that, does this mean separation? Does this mean divorce? Does this mean uh, losing a friendship? Does this mean, what does this mean? Feel the weight of it? Sometimes when things are heavy, it's good to, to chuckle a little bit. And I, I remember this, this humorous story of a man who was on a deserted island. He'd been there for many years. And finally he sees a ship and he builds a fire and he's waving and lo and behold the ship turns and they send out a, 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 a boat to come get him. And he's just overjoyed to be rescued. And they come ashore and they say, thank you for rescuing me. I've been here for, I, I've lost count, 15, 20 years. He says, how in the world did you live here all this long? He says, I, I don't know. I kept myself busy. I, I built a little town. He built a little town. He says, yeah, let me show you. And they came there was a hut. He says, what's this hut? He said, this is the town hall. He said, well, what's this building beside it? This is the library. And what's this building? This, that's, that's my home. And what's this, what's this building with the, look like a steeple? He said, that's, that's my church. He said, well, what's this other building with the steeple? He said, that's the church I don't go to. <laughs> oh, sometimes the arguments that we get into if they weren't so heavy, if they weren't so serious, if you don't do this, it's going to be catastrophic. Maybe we could chuckle more. Continuing in that, that lighter theme, how many, how many uh, committee members of a church does it take to change a life? Though? What? Change? What do you mean change? Let's poke fun and let's preach it. How many preachers does it take to change a life though? Just one. He or she is the case may be. They just stand there like this and the world turns around them. <laughs> oh. But brothers and sisters, the early church had a serious problem. What are we going to do about this? We've got Christian people saying that you've got to keep the law of Moses or you can't be saved. And we've got Gentile people that their history is not within the law of Moses. And yet, they're Christian. They want to be Christian. How are we going to reconcile this? Notice what they did as we read through Scripture. The first thing they did is that they, they took serious the presenting problem. They said, this is real. There's a seriousness to this. We are, we're weighing who can be saved and who can't be saved. Who is right with God and who isn't right with God. And they didn't get into the weeds around that. You see how sometimes when you've got a serious problem that you need to direct, you need to confront directly, Sometimes the temptation is, is to find a less serious problem and focus on that. Let's focus on, because this seems more solid. This seems more doable. This seems like we could get this done quicker and easier and, and we won't create as big a mess. But then you are avoiding the real problem. And so they didn't do that. They they knew what the problem was, they knew what the seriousness of the problem was, and they knew that they needed to solve this problem, 
Because the gospel dwells in heart. Who can come to Jesus? And so they, the second thing they did is that they, they took time to think, to discuss, to pray. They took time to, to let the problem marinate. Sometimes when you've got a serious problem that you really need to spend some time with, you don't want a quick solution. You don't want the first thing that pops in your mind to be the answer to that problem. You need to take time. You need to let it simmer a little bit. You need to let it have a breath of fresh air. And so they listened, they talked, they discussed, they even made a journey all the way to Jerusalem. And that takes time, doesn't it? Back, especially in those days, you had to travel anywhere of any distance. It's going to take you a little time to get there. You're either walking or you're riding an animal. And so they thought and they prayed and they also gathered important facts and the testimonies. As they journeyed, they came through Phoenicia, which was a Gentile region. And they came through Samaria, which was a quasi-Jewish area. Each of them in some ways on the, on the margins of the people that were saying, unless you do this, you cannot be saved. And they listened to the testimonies of people who were Gentile who had received Jesus as their Savior. And they bring all this down to Jerusalem. And that's the third thing. When you're trying to sort through important things, you need to listen to people that know what they're talking about. In other words, don't go to the internet to get your solutions to serious stuff. You need to talk to people that know what they're talking about. You need to understand and listen to people who have experience and time in grave in trying to solve important problems and challenges like this. And so they make their way to Jerusalem to listen to the elders and the apostles, the ones who were with Jesus. And they were silent as they listened to Paul, as they listened to Peter, as they listened to James, the brother of Jesus. Share. When Peter shared of his experience with Cornelius, the centurion, we find it in Acts chapter 10, just five chapters previous to this. And even there, this same question about what are the requirements to come to Jesus, just how Jewish do you have to be in order to be a good Christian? It was something they were talking about before this chapter, and it was something that still did not get completely resolved in chapter 15. They're still talking about it in Galatians, the Apostle Paul is. But they came together, and Peter's story is profound. Because Peter, he was a Jewish Christian. He was one of the 12 apostles of Jesus himself. He was a leader. He was the one that was walked on water because he asked Jesus, let me come to you, Jesus. And Jesus said, come. And he walked on the water for about three, uh, three seconds until he started going down. He said, Jesus, help me. And Jesus reached out and got him. This is the Peter we're talking about. He had a vision. And in his vision, he saw this giant sheep come down. And in the sheep were all kinds of animals that good Jewish people don't eat. Things like maybe rabbits. And maybe one of those cute little pot belly pigs. Maybe a catfish was in there because it doesn't have scales. They, you had all these rules that said you can eat this animal, you can't eat this one. And all these animals were there, and the voice said, Peter, take and eat. He said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean been a good Jewish boy. And it happened three times. And God was preparing Peter because miles away, Cornelius the centurion, he was a Gentile, and a centurion might be, it's, it's hard to know exactly, maybe like a captain in our army. He was, he was a person in charge of about a hundred men and was responsible for what they did and what they didn't do. And so 
He has a vision of an angel. And the angel says, send for Peter. And told him where it was. And when he comes, you listen to what he has to say. And so God is bringing together these two men, a Gentile and a good Jewish boy. Both are believers in God. Both love God. Cornelius loved God, worshipped God, did good things to help people. You know the story of, of Peter. He was with Jesus. He's an apostle. And so God is bringing them together. And so the men arrive right after Peter has his vision of this great sheep coming down. What God has declared clean, you don't declare unclean. And then, we're here to see Peter. So I'm going to go with you. So Peter goes and a few of his friends there in Joppa. They travel there to see Cornelius. Peter shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with Cornelius and his family and his close friends. They believe in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit, and this is key, the Holy Spirit falls upon the Gentiles. And they begin to speak in tongues, which is important because when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues. It was just, a, it was a sign, if you will, of something extraordinary that had happened. And the same thing that happened to them in the upper room happened to these Gentiles. And it's, it's a pivotal moment for Peter because he says, I see now that God shows no partiality, that whoever fears and loves God and tries to do right with God, God loves and receives. In parentheses, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. So Peter shares his story. And Paul and Barnabas, who had been traveling down and sharing the stories that they have had in another part of Acts Paul and Barnabas for a year were in Antioch, where a great number of Gentile people became believers. And scripture says they were first called disciples. They were first called Christians in Antioch. So all these stories are coming together. That's what they're listening to as they come to Jerusalem. And then James, who was the brother of Jesus, not one of the original disciples, it seems he became a leader especially amongst the Jerusalem church, he gets up and he quotes a scripture from Amos that talks about how God's going to bring everybody back together and even the Gentiles will be blessed with God to, suck, to love and serve God. And that's the fourth thing. Whenever we're trying to solve these problems, we need to allow the light of scripture to illuminate our path. Some people look at scripture as a legal document. Well, what can I do and what can I not do? That also means you try to find the loopholes of how you get out of stuff. I see scripture more as that lamp into our path that illuminates the next step. I see the Bible is like a love letter that a father writes back to his children. Maybe like a journal saying, here's the best of life. Here are things that are best practices in how to live your life, to be honest, to be open, to be caring, to be truthful with you. That way of looking at Scripture as a lamp into my path, as a love letter from God, makes me value Scripture more, not less. And I value Scripture. And so, brothers and sisters, that focused on the true problem, they didn't get lost in the grass, they kept focused. They thought about it. They prayed about it. They discussed it. They allowed time for it to marinate. They went to people who knew what they were talking about. People who had experience of what God was actually doing. And they let the scriptures illuminate their path. And they were able to come to at least something of an answer. I can tell you that the idea that Gentiles would be welcomed into the church eventually won the day. And I'm glad it did. Because if it hadn't, you and I might not be here. I'm assuming most of us are Gentiles. Because, brothers and sisters, what was at stake? Unless you do this, you cannot be saved. What was at stake was the gospel of Jesus Christ and the barriers that people might put forward to them. And you've been listening to me long enough to know I do not like barriers. 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what changes us. It's what transforms us. It's what gives us hope. It's what forgives us of our sins. It's what gives us the strength for the living of these days. The gospel enables us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbor as ourselves. The gospel contains in it what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and in his resurrection, and it is powerful, and it changes lives. No barriers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let it free, let it change and transform and forgive and make a difference in everybody's life. So I'm glad that they were able to communicate that powerfully. Even if there were still those that wanted to keep placing the barriers. And you know, I, I think they were genuine. I mean, it's not really here, there, because, well, to be honest, I think the idea that there wouldn't be barriers to the Gentiles to receive Christ won the day eventually. But I could see where, where someone could make a case. When circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign of the covenant, it was said, this is to be a sign forever. Forever seems like a long time. Even Jesus said that I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And so the early church really had to wrestle. They really had to try to come to an understanding. And it wasn't easy. And it's probably not going to be easy for us but the gospel needs to be shared. The gospel needs to be heard. The gospel needs to be lived. The gospel needs to be allowed to transform, and it will transform. Ultimately, you will not bury the gospel. No human being will, God, will bury the gospel of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Because the scriptures make it clear. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, one God who is Father of all, and in all, and through all. I guess, Mike could look at it something like this. You know the difference between a fiddle and a violin? You probably do. You know the difference between a fiddle and a violin? It's the same instrument. It's the same instrument. Now, if you're playing this one instrument in a, a, a symphony, you're playing classical music, and you've got several of them, maybe first fiddle, second fiddle, it's usually called a violin. But if you take the same instrument, and it may be tuned a little different, but if you take the same instrument and you put it in a gospel bluegrass It's a thing. But it's the same instrument. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God who is Father of all and in and all and through all. You see, brothers and sisters, the gospel of Jesus Christ is something that we all need. And Jesus said to those early disciples, Make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that I have taught you. And lo, I am with you all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is on page 171. There's something about that in <coughs>
join us online. May God richly bless you. Join us again next Sunday. Amen.